So, but you heard already good morning, so I don't have to repeat it. And I immediately start with my presentation. I'm talking a bit about right-wing populism seen from, from a European uh, perspective, and I try to link it uh, to the question whether right-wing populists are a problem for democracy or even a threat or there may be even a corrective. So I leave these questions open for my presentation and for the discussion certainly as well. These are more or less the five steps which lead me uh, through my talk, a kind of cognitive map. I will talk at the beginning which are the topics, the themes, uh, right-wing populists are uh, mobilizing, are stressing. And you see there is a certain change of these topics. The second one is who are these right-wing populists in Europe, which is the social, the social structure, for example, of the uh, electorate and the membership. And then I will confront you with a new an explanation why uh, these right-wing populists are so strong at present in uh, Western and Eastern Europe, and why I do think this is not just a trans transient phenomenon. I have certain strong arguments, I believe, that they will stay with us. Uh, and then the question I already uh, mentioned, threat or therapy for representative democracies. And um, do we know something about anti-populist strategies? We can imagine some, but what do we know empirical, uh, about empirical impacts these strategies have? And I can immediately add to this we do not know very much about it, and this is strange. So I present some possible strategies against right-wing populists. Here I have a sequence of themes. Uh, right-wing populists were uh, mobilizing on, and most of them uh, were who started in the 1970s began as anti-tax parties and anti-EU parties, but especially against anti-tax parties. And they emerged in Scandinavia, where you find uh, strong tax states on the one side, and also still up to now the best democracies on the globe. However we measure it, they appear always at the top ranks of uh, these uh, rankings of democracies. In the 1980s, they stressed uh, stronger their uh, critique of the European Union when the European Union uh, intensified the integration they uh, argued this is not the future of our country, uh, of our countries. We do not want uh, to have such a strong European Union and also uh, some of them propagated to leave the European Union. This is certainly a topic which is hot discussed in these days, as you know, if it comes to the British uh, case. But then in the 1990s, uh, more uh, right-wing populist parties emerged on the European continent in Western Europe, but also in Eastern Europe. You find one of the traits which uh, are the strongest one, they are anti-liberal. They are anti-liberal and they are opting against multicultural societies. So they have the uh, idea there should be homogeneous societies and I have uh, immediately to add ethnically homogeneous society. This is at least something uh, which never left their programmatic uh, package. And after the year 2000, and this can be now observed in Germany as well, 
It is especially against Islam. It's not only against migration. Uh, it is especially uh, against migration from uh, Muslim countries. Uh, they uh, do not want, uh, they want to close the borders against refugees, asylum seekers, and uh, migrants. And what is quite interesting, and we did some uh, computerized analysis of many party, electoral party programs. Most of these parties started as neoliberal parties, but now they moved to the left. Uh, they became what one can call socially protectionist parties. These are very bad news for social democratic parties. Uh, because right-wing populist parties now are, to some extent, the workers' parties in uh, Western and Eastern Europe. So these are more or less the four topics I'm sure Jan Werner will talk about in, uh, this as well. Here you see the upswing. The upswing, uh, and look at the uh, blue lines at the beginning, uh, you see the upswing of the electoral success. It is not so dramatic, one might uh, uh, find, however, from the 1980s or the early 1990s, you see a steep increase in uh, the electoral share for right-wing populist parties. Uh, Eastern Europe is certainly... Uh, in Eastern Europe, you find stronger right-wing populist parties uh, than compared to the West. And what is quite a difference, you have at least in two countries, right-wing populists governing as the dominant uh, coalition partners in governments. And we have to discuss whether maybe right-wing populists in opposition are a complete different thing uh, compared to right-wing populist parties in governments if we talk about the impact on democracies. <coughs> if women would take a revenge about the political discrimination throughout the 20th century and proposing uh, to suspend male suffrage for at least 10 years, we may solve the problem. We may solve the problem of right-wing populist parties because they are, uh, to a large extent, male-dominated. But the more they gain votes, uh, the more uh, women will vote for them as well. But still, these are basically strong male-dominated parties. For example, uh, the parliamentary group of the German right-wing populists, AFD, they have only 10% of women among their parliamentary representatives. If it comes to education, uh, you see the green line are the lower education, the middle education are the orange uh, columns, and uh, the blue ones, uh, they have a tertiary education, meaning a university education. And basically, uh, the uh, middle uh, education and also the middle income, uh, the lower middle income are those who are voting for right-wing uh, populist uh, parties in Europe. Uh, are they uh, concentrated more on the countryside, or do you find right-wing populist supporters more uh, in urban areas? Uh, again here, uh, the neighborhood in big urban cities or the uh, supporters are not so numerous than in middle-sized towns and on the countryside. This is going to change in some uh, of the European countries as well. So the typical right-wing populist voter is male, rural, small towns, and has a lower medium income. And the opposite is clear as well. 
those who are not voting for right-wing populist parties, and in many West European countries, the direct oppositional force against right-wing populists are the Green Party, the ecological parties. They are, uh, have high uh, education, the supporters, high education. And as you see in a moment, they have complete different world views than the right-wing populist uh, supporters. And this is what I, why I think we, uh, these parties will stay with us and where I see a new cleavage and conflict line running through most of the Western and East European societies. And I call, and my colleagues uh, from Berlin as well, uh, we call uh, these uh, different oppositional camps, on the one side cosmopolitanism and on the other side communitarianism. Before I come to this cleavage, I will uh, just briefly explain who are the cosmopolitans. The cosmopolitans among the population are basically the winners of globalization. They are uh, among the elites, or let's put it this way, we did empirical research, and the elites are almost completely, almost completely uh, cosmopolitans, meaning they are opting for open borders, open borders in economic transactions, but also open borders for a refugee and asylum seekers or workforce and also open borders for uh, state or national sovereignty. So they are in favor that the nation state gives up sovereignty right to supranational uh, regimes and organizations such as uh, the uh, WTO or especially the European uh, Union. They consider citizenship not only as a nation state based citizenship, they declare a global citizenship simply by being human. So this is a complete different understanding of what citizenships mean. Uh, and one of our colleagues from the London School of Economics has ironically called them, these are the frequent flyers of our uh, societies. They can live basically everywhere. And you find it especially among the high educated urban uh, middle classes. So the communitarianists are in many, reg uh, in, uh, many regards uh, the opposite. Uh, they tend to be the losers of globalization. They come from the lower education strata. They very much insist that the nation state has to be strong. The nation state has to protect them, and they are critical against the European Union. They want to control and the close, to close the borders as much as possible. They think there should be a guiding culture within the societies, meaning that migrants and refugees coming to the societies have to adapt to uh, the indigenous cultural traditions of those societies. Just briefly mentioning there are two versions of these communitarians, meaning they want to rely on a fixed community or a political community to some extent also to an ethnic community. By the way, this is an old idea of social democratic parties. Uh, the Swedish Social Democrats invented in the 1930s what they called people's home, meaning a high solidari solidaristic society with high redistribution by the, stacks, uh, by the tax and social state on the one side, however, on the other side, closing borders. And you find this quite interesting, especially at present in Denmark. This is a classical case of this communitarianism, highly solidaristic, uh, quite a few uh, 
uh, institutions which organize, uh, which organize a redistribution and uh, fostering a strong welfare state. But you have a nasty, so to say, normatively spoken, nasty version of this communitarianism, and this is a nativist, uh, nationalist, right-wing populism. Uh, and as I have said, what I see at least, or our analysis hint at, is that they're becoming, uh, to some extent, chauvinist, social protectionist uh, uh, supporters of uh, their societies. Again, uh, these are uh, the German sociologist Max Weber would say ideal typical construction. They mark the end of the cleavage. And if you control yourself, you will immediately see maybe I, I have both of these types in my consciousness. I can be against neoliberal economics, but being very much in favor opening the borders for refugees. These are the green supporters, for example, in Germany. So think about uh, the more, however, people can be located at the end of this uh, axis, what I call a cultural cleavage between cosmopolitanism and nationalist communitarianism, the more these parties will have uh, future because they can mobilize along uh, such a conflict line. Are these right-wing populists a threat? Uh, let me distinguish between politically, normatively, and functionally. Politically, uh, it depends very much, as I have said at the beginning, whether these populists are in opposition or they stay in government. If they are in opposition, they may function as a corrective to an obvious representational gap left open by the established parties. The established parties then have to win back those voters who went to right-wing populists. If you are in government, then you may change already the institutional fabric of the political regime. And if they are in government, it depends whether they are the junior uh, partner in such a governing uh, coalition, as it is the case sometimes in Scandinavian countries, as it is the case in Italy at present, or in Austria, or if they are the dominant partner in government where they can uh, guide uh, the governance of their country. And I do see a difference whether, and this may be for Latin America relevant as well, if right-wing populists operate within well-established, stable democracies, or they operate within not so consolidated uh, democracies. And the less these democracies are consolidated, the more harm they can do uh, at the government, Poland and Hungary are certainly exemplary uh, cases. Normatively, this uh, seems to me clear, and I already have hinted it. Uh, this uh, is highly problematic. They are exclusive because they want to exclude people from citizenship which uh, are not born them uh, there. They do not want to leave them in. They frame the discourses very much along ethnic and nationalist lines. And this is something which is changing in Europe very strongly. Uh, the, not only the nation state, but nationalism is coming back to some extent into uh, these uh, countries. So from a normative point of view, it is a major threat uh, to a democracy. However, from the functional point of view, which is quite interesting, is uh, 
they activate political discourses. There is less apathy. They bring back uh, the lower and lower medium classes into the political arena. We may discuss that, that they do it under negative signs. However, there is an intensified discourse, and the discourse really focus on elementary question of the society and uh, democracy. And uh, two, uh, some of you may know, uh, two theoretician who uh, clearly distinguish between right-wing populism and left-wing populism. And the basic difference is that left-wing populism, they talk about the people as well, but they talk about the people not in nativist terms. They talk about the people as the have-nots. They talk about the people as the lower classes, which become a subject in politics and in history. And they have a positive uh, perspective on populism or left-wing populism. Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Muff are uh, certainly the most eminent theoretician uh, who arguing uh, that way. They argued now they change the elitist discourse and they bring uh, these people back into uh, the political arena, thereby f uh, filling a representational gap. So what we are witnessing at this time is a repolitization of the discourses. However, also to some extent, now I'm back at the right-wing populism. Uh, now, uh, to, uh, to some extent, uh, this leads to some extent to a polarization of our society. So on the one side, activating discourses, but on the other side, the people may not really listen to the other side. Just to give you, again, an example out of these two camps, the communitarians and the cosmopolitans. Uh, the cosmopolitans tend, tend to be, let's say, consider themselves as having the truth as well. And they are moralizing. <clears throat> politics and this may they may have good normative reason for it I emphasis uh, certainly however uh, they tend to be exclusive as well and the more this is certainly a thing we can discuss the more you moralize uh, politics the less you may be able to forge compromises and this drives, to some extent, the polarization of our uh, societies. I come to my last point. Uh, what do we know about if uh, anti-populist strategies? If we assume that right-wing populist is normatively uh, a threat to democracy, it harms especially one dimension of democracy, not that much the participatory dimension, but very much the dimension of uh, the rule of law, uh, the inclusiveness, and the sensibility versus uh, minorities. And most of these strategies we already have seen, uh, uh, but uh, as I have said, we do not have a systematic evidence about the impacts they have. And I only go through the left column about the, uh, the action. Uh, and I don't talk about, uh, it would take too long, about the risks involved. The one idea is, why not banning these parties? This would be something in a German tradition even uh, uh, the Constitutional Court is very reluctant to do it, to ban these parties because they are enemies of uh, the constitutional order of the political uh, system. Actually, it happened only two times in the history of the Federal Republic of Germany. One uh, time against a Nazi follower successor party and uh, one against the traditional Orthodox Communist Party, both in the 1950s, and then we did not uh, have seen it 
anymore. Isolating them, not talking to them, not inviting them to talk shows, not giving them so prominent news uh, as uh, it happens uh, on the one and the other side of the Atlantic. Certainly not that easy because the media cannot be commanded by governments and the media sell these news and this is, nobody knows it better than uh, Donald Trump who used it very much. So to say, or to ignore them, just to uh, uh, do nothing apart. They do not really exist. This was at the beginning in Germany, but it changed then quite fast. Another idea coming very often from uh, green ecological or social democratic parties, why not to change the topic? Move it away from the migration question. Move it away from nationalism. Transform it in socioeconomic topics. This is a nice idea, and I am very skeptical that this is, uh, will work. Uh, since I have shown to you, there is a left-right distributional cleavage, but there is also a strong dynamic cultural cleavage as well. And you cannot simply talk about health, talk about uh, pensions, uh, talk about unemployment benefits and let the people forget about migration, about uh, uh, multiculturalism and so forth. Uh, however, we do not know uh, sufficiently about it. Co-opting themes, so to say, co-opting, for example, the migration question and reformulate it in more moderate terms, in less racist, xenophobic terms, but be keen uh, and saying we do not want to have uh, very many of them. To some extent, this is a Danish st strategy uh, I have uh, talked about in the beginning. Adapting these positions could be another one, so to say, if you can beat uh, them, join them. This is very close to co-opting, and what we see more and more and more, the traditional parties are coalizing with them. Here the idea is, if these populist, right-wing populist parties are in government, they have to be responsible. They cannot be just irresponsible opposition claiming things which nobody can really materialize in government. So these are some of the strategies uh, one can think of. Nevertheless, and I repeat it, and with that I finish my uh, brief presentation, we do not know very much about empirically, and this is certainly one of the things we have to do and we could do as uh, political and social scientists uh, since in more than or now 12 countries in Europe, right-wing populists uh, were a state already in government. Thank you very much for your patience listening to this.